Let's bring in my boy, Jason Cole, and who dealt with a lot of you guys. Did he just say what I thought he said? Did that coach just say what I thought he said? Hey, I, you know, I, I don't know how you would impugn the character of so many NFL coaches. <laughs> how dare you say? How dare you say that a coach or an organization would lie to you and make up something that never actually happened like how, like sean payton saying i don't handle like contracts <laughs> i have nothing to do with i have nothing I'm to not do with negotiating him for deal. money i'm benching him for production now we find out three weeks earlier they went we want the rewording of the injury clause in your contract or you were gonna bench you oh okay <laughs> How'd that work out? Not well, because you're not supposed to use playing time as a negotiating tool. You just oh, not. do you think he's got a you think he's got a grievance with the players association? I don't think it's a grievance he's gonna win. It, look, it's not a grievance you're actually gonna win. Okay, but it's supposed to be an understood thing. And this is in the CBA that playing time is just you know, you make decisions on whether guys play on merit. That's what you're supposed to do. Right now, we both know that that doesn't happen. That you know, guys get close to to you know, like if you're out of it, team's not any good, and you know you don't want to spend the money. Yeah, you you hold back on guys getting the playing time and stuff like that. That happens a lot, right? Um, just like there are teams that reward players. Like if you're supposed to get to like ninety percent playing time, and you're on a good team, and a guy gets to like eighty eight or eighty nine percent, a lot of times they'll pay out the bonus, right? Because, hey, look, it just didn't quite work out for you, but the intention was to get there, so we'll, we'll reward you. I think Reggie Wayne had a clause in his contract one time, and and Jim Irsay paid him off, um, you know, on on it because you know it, it wasn't Reggie's fault they didn't get the one or two more catches he needed or whatever it was, and so they looked at that and said we're going to do the right thing by the player. But look, when you're a player, you need to understand. When you put clauses in your contract that are dependent upon you having having to play and perform in games, and if they're making decisions to move on from you, you're going to get benched, right? <laughs> like, that's just going to happen. Like, you built – you have, have to understand that you built that into your contract. But technically – the team is not supposed to come to you and say we're going to bench you if you don't change your contract. They're not they're not supposed to do that. But it's hard to enforce. So I don't think Russell wins anything. But it was a crappy way for the Broncos to do business. It's dishonest. Peyton should have just come to him and said, you know, both Sean Peyton and George Peyton should have come to him and said, "Look, we're going a different direction." We're not going to do this. We're going to put you on the bench. And, you know, let's try and find a way to, to work this out amicably. And be honest with the be honest with the player. All right, let's move on to this. Jason, are you still willing to walk out on that limb that you would take Jalen Hurts over Lamar Jackson? Um, well, no, not based on how Lamar's played this year. Lamar's had a great year. You know, like he changed he changed it. He changed the narrative. And I will say this. I was having this discussion with a guy who's a fan, not a not a media person or anything like that. But we both said it simultaneously. Lamar has now proved to be a better quarterback this year than I think he was even in his MVP year when yeah. he put up some outrageous stats. Like he, his, the ball placement, uh, you know, on certain throws, the decision making on when to throw, the decision making on I'm running, but I'm running to set up a throw first. And then if I have to take off and go get six, seven, eight yards or whatever, I'll do that. I'll still do that. Then I'll get a big gain occasionally because he's still fast enough to get some big gains, right? But he's not living on his legs. He's living to set up the throws. And I'll say this. He's become more accurate. I, I, I you know. Todd Munkin. There's, there's, well, I don't know if it's Munkin necessarily or if it's as much as he's now thrown a lot of passes, Okay. As instead of like when he was at Louisville, where he was a, run, a runner first and he'd throw it a little bit. And then, you know, his first couple of years in the league, again, runner first, and now he's going to throw it. 
that accuracy has developed as he's thrown it more, which again, which is, I, I would say something to a lot of college quarterbacks. There is a value to staying in college and throwing a lot of balls. Right? Rock Purdy. Right. There's a, there's a great value to just getting a lot of passes in, you know, like those, like the kid um, Penix. At, Penix, at Michael Penix, four years at Indiana, now at Washington. Right, and and he's got a funky motion that I don't yep. really like, but is you know is still, but but he slings it and he's super accurate. I and love him. Still, yeah, well, I didn't earlier in the season, but then I saw you know I've seen him a couple more times, and it's like. Okay, it's turning and turning. And then in this last playoff game, I was like, holy cow, what am no I watching? Doubt. Yeah, and, but he had 500 throws this year. Yeah. 500 throws. You get better. You, you see more. You throw the ball more. Lamar Jackson has now had, you know, another four more years of throws to make, and he's played full-time this year. So, yeah, some of it's Todd Munkin and the design of the, of the offense. Give Munkin credit for that. But some of it is the more you do something, the better you get at it as you repeat it. And that's what Lamar's done. And so he changed, he's changed my opinion on it. I still like Jalen Hurts, but Lamar's Lamar's now flipped it around and become better than him. How about this, Jason? And I, you know, the reason I brought Munkin up is that okay, so check out what they did for him. Like you said, this guy was in the era of Mahomes. Brady was still active. Rodgers was active. You 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 had Bree still going, I think, at the time. When that guy won that consensus all um, MVP, unanimous MVP um, in 17. And all of a sudden, you're looking at that guy and you're like, okay, he's 26 now. He's better now. It's not so much numbers-wise. He's more impactful in games. So what did they do? They got a quality offensive coordinator. And put around him so that it he brought the best of his abilities out. In Philly, they went and got a first year coordinator in Brian Johnson, who has never called a game professionally in his life. And they got a first year quarterback coach, and they just paid a guy 50 million. You would think if your biggest asset in your building is 50 million and you're putting unqualified people around a quarterback. Well, let's, How let's about stop. this? Let's go fair here. Inexperienced people. Inexperienced people, yes. Inexperienced people around your number one asset you're trying to develop. How? how why would you put lesser experienced people mm -hmm. in the building next to your number one asset? Where in Baltimore, they went out and got a higher quality guy. They felt, and it's panned out to be the top seed and an MVP. Right. And look, there's a value to it. Like, with Peyton Manning, well, who's one of the guys in almost his entire career? Tom Moore. Tom Moore was older than dirt when Peyton was a rookie, right? And was with him for almost his entire career because Tom Moore had seen everything, right? And yeah, he survived. Not... He sur he survived um, the first coach there, the the playoff wow. guy when they got Tony Dungy in there, he was the only guy that really survived. Yeah. I'm not sure where, how, where Jim Moore, was. Jim Moore senior was the coach. I think. Yeah. Jim Moore senior was the coach made the playoff remark. They fired and they brought in Tony, Tom Moore, who, you know, like Tony knew Tom Moore from years he, he before. Did. And I think, I don't know if Howard Mudd was there already, but you always had older experienced guys like Howard Mudd understood. Okay. Here's the offensive line play. And this is how it's supposed to work with the quarterback right this yep. is the this is the footwork that the quarterback needs to do to make the offensive lineman you know effective and this is how we're supposed to run it along with tom moore calling plays and helping out and look if you ever met tom moore and didn't know what he was you'd go who's this mumbling old man right you know and, and it's right but that man's an encyclopedia he's, he's like, like a, Bernie Zampezi. right it's like, you know, you know, not he's not a head coach type of guy, but he knows everything backwards and forwards yep. and can tell you about plays probably from when Sid Luckman played, right? Yep. So like, yeah, you need to have those guys a lot of time. It's it's like one thing that head coaches, young head coaches.
hopefully we're able to connect here with Jason here. Um, but he's right about Tom Moore. Tom Moore was with um, Peyton almost for a full decade. Almost for a full decade when he was developing his opportunity to become a Super Bowl-style coach. Are we still frozen a little bit here? Um, I think we're still frozen here a little bit. Okay, so let's see if we can get Jason Cole back with us here in a second here. And, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of the conversation and a narrative that we've been talking about when you're talking how the Ravens went out and they put quality people around them. By the way, look at what also out they did personnel-wise. They kind of went down the line of what the Eagles did. They went out, got Odell Beckham. They turned around, and would you not agree? Right, Tone? Think about what they did in Baltimore. They basically duplicated They basically duplicated what they did in Philadelphia in Baltimore. They went out, got Odell Beckham. They drafted Zay Flowers. They brought in a high-powered coordinator, Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown. And to what J uh, Jason was talking about, when you have quality offensive coordinators, right, Jason, you're going to be able to move the sticks. And it's important to have people like that in the building. Yeah, look, as, as I was trying to say before, this whole thing broke down, unfortunately. But one of the great pieces of advice that Sean McVay got when he first took over as an, as a head coach was hire a couple old guys on your staff who aren't afraid to tell you, you know, the truth. And probably have been head coaches. One of the one of, who was his defensive coordinator when he went to the Rams, Wade Phillips. Wade right. Phillips had been around, seeing everything. Told him, "Like this, is, you're going to run into this. It's not the first time any coaches run into this. This is probably this is how we handled. This. this is how it was handled wrong in this place. This is how it was handled right in this place. Here's some suggestions. Here's some ideas. And that's better than." Yeah, like the experience just tells you how to handle situations, how to handle players. And yes, the, the, the Eagles would have benefited if they had said, we're going to bring in a young guy like Brian Johnson, who we think is going to be a great, great offensive coordinator, but we're going to make sure that the quarterback coach is an older guy or vice versa. You know, Alex Van Pelt, coach. bring a guy like that in as a quarterback coach, something like that. Yeah. I mean, again, part of it is you have to know the scheme too. And there's some of that. You got to know what, what kind of scheme are we running? What do we want Jalen to be comfortable with? How are we trying to progress? And where is he in the progression of, okay, we're at, we're at point A in year one or two. We're at point B in year two or three, right? We want to get to this point. That, and that's, again, part of the Lamar Jackson development that you talk about is the things that he's doing now, he couldn't do four or five years ago because he wasn't ready to do them, Okay. You know, there's, there's there are poor parts of your career, and he got there, right? Like I had doubts about whether he would get there. He got there. Like normally, guys don't get more accurate in their career. This guy has. Josh Allen has gotten more accurate. Now, Josh, what Josh Allen hasn't done is he hasn't learned to peel back and like sort of stop taking so many risks. And I, you know, I've been hearing from Bills fans like two weeks ago before Lamar Jackson had the five touchdown outing last week you know bills fans were ranting about oh you know josh allen has 40 touchdowns where would we be without josh allen this and that i said yeah but he's got like three interceptions in negative territory in losses that cost you points and they're like well we led, we left the field with leads okay it doesn't matter if you left the field with with a lead and then the defense gave it up you gave up points earlier in the game and that changed the situation and the outcome of the game so so like Josh Allen, for all the great things that Josh Allen does, there are still moments where he makes mistakes that put you in a bind. And you have to deal with that very young quarterback. And he has to get through that. I want to take you in this direction here on executive of the year. And I think it's between two guys, John Lynch and Eric DaCosta in Baltimore. And let me, let me kind of go on here on the, both on why I think those two guys are the guys. I mean, if you go last year in Baltimore, conversation of Lamar was going to play in the postseason, if he was going to play, he was 95%. He was bitching about his contract. There were only two teams that kind of casually contacted them. They gave him the money. They brought in all these people. They brought in Beckham. They get Ray, uh, Zay Flowers. 
The guy's an MVP. They're the number one seed in the AFC. They dug out of a mess. Look at what Lynch dug out of. Future of the team on the line with those three first-round picks with Trey Lance disaster. Kyle Shanahan coaches his ass off. This guy Purdy's probably going to finish second or third in the MVP voting. That football team's the number one seed in the NFC. They dig themselves out of that. And now you're looking at 12 pro bowlers with alternates uh, when it comes to the 49er roster. Who do you think has done a better job at putting his team in a position to potentially win a Super Bowl? Eric DeCosta in Baltimore or John Lynch in San Francisco? That's a tough one, man. That's a really tough one. But I will say this. DaCosta and, and probably the organization, Bashadi too. And, 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 and Ozzy's still a consultant. And Ozzy's still a consultant. And so there's a lot going on there, right? Yeah. That they never made this a war with Lamar. And it, it, right. And it never got, it never, they never got into a public spat with them. There were times where there were leaks and things like that that Lamar didn't like. And it so easily could have went off the reservation, off the rails. Well, it, it usually does go off the rails it, 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 when it gets nasty like this, right? Because there were so many opportunities to get nasty when it gets, fr when you get to the franchise tag, right? Like, oh, well, he's not that yep. good. He's this, he's that. You can say the wrong things. They kept it really tight there of, look, we're going to allow this to play out. But we're not saying anything other than, Lamar, go do what you need to do, right? Like, we understand what your position is. You feel you need to be compensated this way. We understand what it is. You want this. We're offering this. And those normally in this league, that becomes such high melodrama. It gets oh, out of control and splits the team. I can't believe both have been rewarded, Jason. Right. And so in this situation, they allowed something to play out. And they didn't pre press the panic button and say, oh, well, let's give in to the player and give him whatever he wants or get this done early to avoid it, which so many teams do. Like, you know, since I did with Burrow, the, the, the Chargers did it with Herbert. Most teams, you know, like, look, pay up front. They said, look, we believe in this kind of a contract. You believe in this. We understand there's a difference here. We're not willing to budge on that. And especially when you're dealing with a player who technically doesn't have an agent, right? Is his represented. Mom. Yeah, he's represented and driven by his mother and being in charge of this. Like, do you know how many different ways that thing can go sideways? Most of the time when you're in an arbitration type style of conversation, you've oh. got to be negative about your son to the mom and you're negotiating. <laughs> what a it's tough a position. Hey, usually when you're talking to Drew Rosenhaus or Jimmy Sexton and you're talking to guys like that, you could be an asshole, Jason. But when you're talking to the player's mom, you're like this, good night. What a tough position to be in to try it, to it, negotiate it, down yes. and get a fair – I mean, in, a, in an enviable situation, they must have been in all year with that. Right, and they had to play – this is a very delicate situation. So I give DaCosta the credit for never letting the frustration, or never letting the circumstances, never let that overtake the larger goal of, He's our quarterback. Yeah. We're going to figure this out. We're going to pay him. We're maybe not going to pay him exactly what he wants, but we're, he's going to be happy at the end of it. And he's going to have to go through this whole process in order for him to understand what we're offering. And in the meantime, he's going to be totally on board, totally bought in, not feel negative about us. And then we have to go out and, and make this thing work end of the day, he's come out an even better player. This is the best version of Lamar Jackson yeah, yeah. I think we've ever seen. And, and, and I know people say, look at the stats, look at the stats from 2019 or whatever the MVP year was, blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you right now, as a quality football player to run, you know, run most situations, this is the best version of Lamar Jackson we've ever seen. You know, Jace, 
I don't know what it is, man, but boy, I'll tell you what, the Harbaugh's on the uh, football world right now. Jim so maybe two titles. Maybe two Jim, titles. Uh, Jim Harbaugh may win the national championship, and John Harbaugh may win a Super Bowl here in the same calendar football season. And I would say this to you. I mean, I think John Harbaugh may be the most underrated coach in the NFL. And Jim, the market for him, especially with all the BS going on at Michigan, I mean, how don't you pay if you're Los Angeles and the Chargers and he's got a relationship with the Spanos family, how do you not? And since they fired Tom Telesco, and that's been an organization going all the way back to Alex Smith or A.J. Smith, going all the way back to him, they've been kind of a centric GM organization and head coach kind of guy. But now you've blown that all out. Do you think they're making room for this guy to have control? And can you imagine him with Justin Herbert? I mean, well, but or what even happens, him with Josh Allen in Buffalo. What about the relationship between the Raiders and Harbaugh? Tremendous. Yeah, Michigan Tremendous. guy. Michigan guy. Brady's, you know. Oh, Tony's you know, got a little percentage of the team there. Well, I'm, not I'm, yet, but, yeah. but technically, you know, you like, think he'll be a hot commodity? Oh my God, yes! Like he, you know, he's got three bidders. He's got he's got Michigan's begging to keep, you know, beg to keep him, right? And they've got all the money in the world. The Chargers, we'll see if they open up the pocketbooks. You know, you know, Mark Davis will open up the pocketbooks, but they That's still nothing. have that lawsuit out there. Whatever. The and, thing. But, but but just remember this with Mark Davis. Mark Davis doesn't care about the money. Okay? He doesn't care. Okay? He cares about when he cares about winning. Now he doesn't know how. All right. But he'll throw money at, at a situation. He threw money at Gruden. He threw money at McDaniels. He'll find a way to throw money at people to solve a problem because he how about doesn't David know. Tepper? Dave Tepper will throw money, but Tepper's – I think the problem with Tepper is Tepper is probably almost as psychotic as Jim. <laughs> and can, you be, can you imagine those two guys in a meeting? Har Jim Harbaugh and David Tepper. Oh, Jim, Jim would Panthers. not – Jim would throw hands in a heartbeat. If Tepper oh, those two guys it would look like a WWE wrestling yeah. match talking about who oh, the draft oh, in the third fun. round. There is a great story about about Harbaugh at Stanford. They at, when he was, they were playing like two on two basketball, um, some of the coaches, and at a certain point it started to get kind of physical, and instead of two on two basketball, it was one guy backing the other guy down every single time. And it's like I don't know which coach it was, but it was like a linebacker coach or something like that. Some guy on the staff, and him and Harbaugh are just like throwing elbows at each other backing each other down. It's not even basketball. It's just a brawl on the court. And that's just how, that's with his, one of his own guys, right? It's wrestling hoop. Yeah, it's wrestling hoop. So, like, yeah, Harbaugh and Tepper, I don't know who's a good match for Tepper right now. I think Tepper's, Tepper's going to have to learn a lot of really hard lessons. Sort of like, I get the feeling this is like George Steinbrenner in the early days with the Yankees, where yeah, he Yeah, but George really won. No, not early. Not early. Seven, he bought the team right. in 73, and he took him three years to win because he won in Right, it took him three years. It, 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 76, but, you know, they got swept by the Reds in 77. That's when they won it. Yeah. No, it, it took them a while to figure it. It took George a while to figure it out. It did. I think, he I got think suspended in there, too, prior to that, just so yeah, for the right. Knicks and stuff. Yeah. So in, in, any, in any case, I just think it's going to take Tepper a while because football will beat you up. Yeah. Because not only do you lose, like in baseball, at least you play seven games a week, right? <laughs> and you're going to probably win a few of those, right? You know, one or two, right? And so you feel like, a, you feel good after the wins. In football, when you lose, you, it bakes, it bakes you for a week, right? Yeah. If not an entire offseason. And that's part of the problem with Tepper because he's so impetuous. Like throwing a drink at a fan, like, what are you doing? Just you're, you're you're the owner. Be a As my bosses say, why punch down? Right. It's a. It, I down. always love the the. In, do you remember the la, in the last dance where Jordan's talking about getting in the fight with with Kerr, and he goes, "I feel like this big because I just punched the smallest guy on our team." 
right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what, what? And that and he loves Kerr because Kerr, you know, Kerr, Kerr stood up to him and all that other stuff. You know, and they're, they're and they're both tough guys. You know, they're. Both I actually like Steve Kerr because he's got an opinion. Yeah, Steve. Look, Steve Kerr's not willing to back down from anybody, no. right? And that's a great and that's a great thing, even though he's a small guy. But Kerr, but Jordan's like, why am I punching Steve Kerr? What am I doing? You know, right. Dave, Tepper, Dave Tepper, why are you throwing a drink at a fan? What are you doing? From your owner's box, it's like sitting on the throne throwing grapes <laughs> at people. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's so Jason, bad. he's like throwing like uh, strawberries from his throne and it's so condescending. It's and it's it's it, it it's such a bad look, like and and this is a guy who already like people in in Charlotte are starting to catch on to like his game. You know, if they didn't already get the the whole problem with like the Rock Hill debacle and how he how he you know he pulled a fast one on the people in Rock Hill and all the other stuff that he's done, but like they're starting to sit there and go, look, dude, you ain't winning. <laughs> Hey, you, Jerry you, Richardson was a tool, but at least he won. <laughs> a, he, well, at least he won. And also, by the way, Jerry Richardson was one of them, right? Yeah, right. De Tepper is Tepper is a carpetbagger. Throwing grapes town. at fans. <laughs> right. He's a, he, he's a he's a New Jersey carpetbagger, <laughs> Pittsburgh guy. Like, it's the Civil War all over again with, Te with Tepper leading the way, leading the oh, way as a Yankee. You know, like. It's a bad deal for, for hey Jace. For let me get to um the Hall of Fame here. Sure. Um, when you guys pare it down now, you pared it down. I I saw your list. Um well, it's the list, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the list. Okay. Yeah. And I saw it and I gave my opinion on it, and I gave my opinion to Jared Bell. Um, I also did to Goslin mm -hmm. and I did to um Howard Balzer. And so I kind of I, I stuck to the same guys that I said, but I won't say. But I will I, I will say that. What's the process now? Is there any communication with any of the voters, or do you guys take your your intel, your gathering of information, and do you then take it to that meeting, and then you guys sit around like the Cardinals do, trying to pick a pope? Is that how you guys sit there and doing it? Then we see smoke coming out from the uh, Hall of Fame voters, and we know when we have uh, when we have Hall of Fame guys, is we see the smoke coming out from the room. Yeah, the the the, 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 the the airport Marriott in Atlanta, there'll be a little smoke stack <laughs> yeah. with, the white, with the white There's smoke. smoke coming out. Yeah. We have we have candidates. <laughs> yes, um, yes, I think it goes like that. I'm pretty sure. Um, Do you guys get fed? Yes, we get when fun. you're in there, okay. I was just curious. Yeah, 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 it's a nice lunch, nice, nice breakfast. You know, the whole okay. thing. It's catered. It's, it's, so it's, it's breakfast neat. and lunch. You're in there. Yeah, that breakfast long. and lunch. And it's not, you know, like it's not out of the you know vending machine or anything. Like okay, that. good. So it's better than it's better than the vending. Machine. So you're not getting a Jersey Mike's. You're getting right. actually a decent meal when you're in. There. <laughs> hey, Jersey Mike's is not so. Bad. I know. I'm you know, with you. I like Jersey Mike's. Okay. I, yeah. I, I'm I think there. Jersey, I like it too. Uh, yeah, I take a Jersey Mike sandwich for lunch. That's okay. No, um, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. So, so um, look, there's a lot more information to come in, but there's no discussion among among us that's formal. You know, are there guys? You know, are, are there guys calling other voters and saying, "Hey, you know, what do you think?" and stuff like that? Yeah, in the past, have there been sort of coalitions of voters working together to get a certain guy in? Yeah, that's happened. That's what I mean you know, by politicianing. Are there is there politicianing? Look, like the whole process is politics. Okay, now how formal or informal it is, you know, it, it sort of depends on how, how of your view of you know, how politics works. But yeah, there have been plenty of times that guys have asked me, well, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about that guy? And I'm honest. I tell have you ever I been about. asked this, Jason? I'll vote for this guy if you vote for this guy. No, I've not ever been asked that. I've been do you told think that, goes that on? I have been told that that went on in the past. You know, Edwin Pope told me stuff like that would happen. And it's cringeworthy. Love, Edwin. Love uh, Edwin's the, was the Pope to speak uh, to the Cardinals, right? So he was um, one of and, my dearest backers, and him, the guy in Tampa too, 
where two of yeah. my dearest friends, Tom, Tom McCune, Tom McCune and him love Dan Cilio. And my God, did I love, did I love Edwin Pope? My God almighty covered my entire career. And right. he was such a God, man, he, I, him and Tom McEwen, I just love they were, those two. They were, they were great. But I'll say this. Some of that has existed in the past. Does it exist now? Not that I've ever heard of. But okay. I also think that most guys wouldn't, they know me well enough that they wouldn't come to me with that proposition because they know I'm not being it. I wouldn't be into it. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to trade favors like that. Okay. I'll tell you, like, you know, I know that there's certain guys who support certain candidates this year and they support other candidates, right? And sometimes I like this candidate and I don't like this candidate. And I'm willing to tell a guy, yeah, I like the, can the candidate you're, support you're supporting over here, I'm good with. The candidate you're support supporting over here, I'm not, not as good with. And I'll be honest with guys about that and say, look, it's hard for me to overcome. It's, it's hard for me to come to voting for this guy because I just don't see it. And I'll tell guys that straight up. And I think that they know from that, like I'm not a horse trader that way. The other thing about it is for me is I'm not speaking up on behalf. I'm an, I'm, I'm an at-large voter. Um, no pun intended, but um, I, I'm not affiliated with any city. So I never, I'm never openly doing the introduction for a guy. Right. So like, I'm not sitting and presenting you know, this candidate. Now there are candidates I obviously like more than. Some I think other Howard Balzer's like that too. He, no, he's in San, he's a St. Louis guy, so I think. Yeah. No, no, well, he's a Phoenix he's a, guy now. He's, well, now, yeah, but he, does he do the Cardinals or does he? He do does the, the Cardinals. Rams? He works. He works yeah. in that market, but I don't know if he's the beat writer because I think don't you have to be the beat writer, or at I least know. It, like it's all cloudy now because media has changed so yeah. much. But Howard was a presenter. I don't know if he still is a presenter. He was in St. Louis. I know that for he both was, the Cardinals yeah. and Rams. Right, and he presented. He's presented Tory Holt multiple times. Well, he's pimping. He's pushing. He asked me, "Do I think Tory Holt is a Hall of Fame player?" And I said, "I do. I think he and Reggie." And listen. You know, for me with Andre Johnson, Andre Johnson's the better player, but right. Reggie Wayne is the more accomplished player. And so, and Holtz and Holtz is accomplished too. And Holtz so is accomplished, right? And Tory Holt is accomplished, and was on one of the best offenses in pro football. See that to me, you've got to be unique to be in a conversation for that position to be something has to separate you. And I'm not talking about making all decade teams. And I know that's important, all pros and all that. But to me, like I saw Rodney Harrison and I'm like, Rodney Harrison has two pro bowls. If Rodney Harrison belongs on that list, how in the hell is Jack Tatum not on that list? Jack Tatum was 10 times the more decorated college pro and more intimidating and played on a unique team with that Raider team with Madden than Rodney Harrison will ever be. But because Rodney's on TV, Rodney Harris, and because he didn't paralyze anybody, Tatum's not going to get the justice that he deserves. Tatum is more of a hall is a Hall of Fame candidate than Rodney Harrison. Name me one thing Harrison's done better than Jack Tatum. Well, from a numeric standpoint, like I'm not here to argue the case of, of Rodney Harrison, right? So let's just start with that. Okay. But Rodney Harrison is a 30-30 guy with sacks and interceptions. So he's got some he's got some numerical accomplishments. That I didn't know. Yeah. So there are some things with Rodney Harrison, and there are some Super Bowls in there, you know, which yeah. Tatum as well. So look, there's there are some things that are work. There's a reason Rodney Harrison made the final 15. Well, he made I the five. I didn't realize the 30-30 thing. Yeah, and so you know that's what got Rodney. Yeah. That's what got Rondé Barber the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean, and, and we're along with Rondé, you know, played at a very high level. Look, I always compare Rondé Barber is to me a football version of Don Sutton. Yeah, you know, like that guy took the field every week. He did his job every single week. He may you're not have get been nine innings from Don Sutton, and you're, you're going to get gonna, you're going to get you're you're 20 some he, odd, he, he's going to take he's going to take the ball every five days. 
and he is going to he is going to pitch his ass off, and take you know Ronnie Barber's going to take the field. He's the all time winningest Dodger pitcher. I know. I, trust me. I, I grew up. I grew up in the Sutton. and Kershaw on it. Yeah. No, but Sutton's up there. You know, Sutton is the guy, but he's not nearly the he's not nearly the electric pitcher that of all the well other on. guys. That, yeah, he ain't he ain't Fernando. He ain't Koufax. He ain't Drysdale. Yeah, he ain't no, Kershaw. None of, he's not, he's none of those guys. But he took the ball every fifth day, and Tiki and God, why do I keep saying Tiki? Ronde. Took the field every week for a long, long time and compiled some numbers that go along with it to prove the quality of his play. And he was a champion as well. He checks a lot of boxes. Over but 20 he's not, back, over 20 INTs. He did some something like right. that too. So, but you would yeah. never look across there and say that's Deion Sanders. No, 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 no. But you would like you said, he was a guy that showed up and put his lunch pail. Do you think Eric Allen is in that conversation? Yes, absolutely. Eric Allen is in the conversation. The one box that he doesn't check is the title check. You know, like Do you it doesn't think it'll be close for him. Yes, I think that he's gonna be. I would I would I would guess, and this is purely a guess. And this is just not based on conversations with anybody else, because I haven't discussed Eric Allen with Anybody else in the room? I've read stuff that people have sent me about Eric Allen, whether that's Paul Domwich or other people who have sent me stuff. You know, Paul does a great job. You know, you know. Is uh, Tom helping. presenting him? He's present. Yeah, Dom is presenting him. So Dom okay. is doing that, right? And Dom's going to do a great job presenting Eric Allen. He did a great job when he presented um, Sam. Um, who's the linebacker? I'm trying to remember um, who played played with New Orleans. Um, uh, Sam Mills. Yeah, Sam Mills. He did a great job presenting the Philadelphia side, the Stars side for Sam Mills, right? So, like, Paul's going to do a great job on that, I anticipate. And I would I would place a small wager, if I read the room correctly, that Eric Allen will, will survive the cut from 15 to 10. And, again, this is just inside my head. I, I, I get see- it. I get it. He'll survive. The question is whether he goes from ten to five, and that's what I don't know. Like, and that one, that one gets hard because we've got some guys like Antonio Gates is on there, and and oh, I think he's a slam dunk. He probably is on on my survey. Has there been has there been another tight end quarterback uh, combo that's had more touchdowns than Rivers and him? I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Probably maybe not. Kelsey and maybe Kelsey and um, Mahomes, Mahomes are getting up there. You know, Witten never Kronk played with and one. Brady. Yeah, I mean it's up there. Look, look, just the fact of the matter is, Antonio Gates was was a monster of a of a of an of an impact guy. You know? Was it better and, than Winslow though? Right? No, Winslow's the archetype for a, for a receiving for a receiving tight end. It goes it goes Winslow, Tony Gonzalez. Travis Kelsey, Gronkowski, right? And Gronkowski's probably, when you put it all together, is the best overall because I block. think he is. Right. He's the best overall because he's going to mash you. But he's even great as a receiver. He's yeah. he's in the discussion among those guys. He's but got Chris when, Carter hands. Right. And and ran good routes. Like he's, you know, like he 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 can he can get over the top of you, right? He he was the most un- the, the only person I ever saw Jason ever defend him well was Ryan Shazier. He was the only, and when Shazier got paralyzed, they lost that, they lost that seam cover guy, that Tampa two type of guy that Tomlin likes to run. They've never yeah. replaced that Ryan Shazier. And every time Gronk got in that game against the Steelers after Shazier was out, he crushed them. Yes. He because just couldn't. It took a special. Defended. It took a special talent. You know, he was going to overwhelm safeties and he was going to outrun the linebackers. The whole thing that we talk about all the time. But look, so Gates is. I don't think Gates is in the discussion with those four guys for the for the greatest tight no tight end of all time. But he is at the top of the next the next yeah. Run. 
And he is, you know, like the, he's a better player than Jason Witten. I think Jason Witten's a Hall of Famer, right? Okay. You know, he's a better player than, you know, Tony Gonzalez. And Tony Gonzalez was a first ballot guy, no question about it, right? I think he's better um, than the guy Smith from the Cowboys and Cardinals. Yeah. Right. I mean, was that Jerry or Jackie? I always get those guys. Jackie. Confused. Yeah. So look, he's better than Ditka. Yeah. Um, and Ditka's a first ballot kind of guy. Um, so yeah, I think Gates Gates goes in. So when you start talking about who's gonna make the five, like I think Gates has a has a strong case to be one of the five. I think Julius Peppers has a strong case to be one of the five. I think Freeney has a case to be one of the five. We, he didn't get in last year. Um, after that, it starts to get – now it starts to get really dicey. You know, like, And that's just my opinion. I think Patrick Willis has a strong case to be in that, in that group too, but it's a short career. So, we're, you know, look, we'll go through the process. And I could see where none of the four guys that I just mentioned get in. I doubt it, but I can see where none of those four get in, and we got five five different guys that we're talking about. I'm going to take you out of this, and one last thing here. It looks like um, um, some people are talking about this. Dalvin Cook may have signed with the Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, if that's true, I'll tell you this, Jason. I think he's got something in the tank left. I think it was a bad situation yeah, yeah, in yeah, New York. Yeah. If that's yeah, true, Dalvin Cook fell apart. signed. Not not his Ravens. fault, not the Jets. Not his fault, not the Jets' fault. It just didn't work out. Um, so you put Dalvin Cook with Lamar Jackson now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. That's some South Florida stuff right there. That's, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's a party on South Beach in your, in your I, I'll office. tell you this. If I'm the AFC teams, like if I'm Buffalo, I may have wanted that for my guy. And if I'm, you know, putting him next to Pacheco in Kansas City, I might have wanted to kick the tires on that a little bit too to give me another oh, weapon. I'm sure, I'm they're sure. not really good at the perimeter. Uh, look, just, uh, let's put it this way. Dalvin Cook knows what it's like to be a front runner. You know, he's got <laughs> – okay, yeah. Uh, he he likes being a front runner, right? And, yeah. You know, that whole that whole FSU career kind of got wasted. I think he ain't playing anymore. Like I'm I'm not here for the I'm not here for the for the you know camaraderie. I want FSU. some hardware. We'll yeah, I shit. want I want some. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like talking Stanford. about Stanford. Come on, uh, man. no, it's worse. They're traitors. <laughs> FSU's they're traitors now. They're already because they already trying to sue to get out of their conference. See, uh, I know, know why you're probably not going to put F Aaron Rodgers in the first ballot Hall of Fame because he's a cow guy. There's not a chance in hell you give that guy first ballot because he's a cow guy. There's no way. There's no way. You're, you're then the, probably the reason that you don't look at Hardy yeah, Nickerson. Let me, let me, let me, let me you don't look at Hardy because Hardy Nickerson should be looked at, but you don't care because he's a cow guy. Uh, hard, hardware Nickerson is uh, was a hell of a player. I, 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 <laughs> Exactly. Look yeah, at the well, way you bail on that. Great player, but you know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, look, Roger's going to make the Hall of Fame, and I'm going to vote for him. So let's just get that out of the way. But if I are could, you voting for Eli? I got. It. I hate when he got Ajita. I, I, I don't. Yeah, well, I, I don't uh, know. No, I, I look. I'm Trump. This is how I look at Eli, and you know, and I've told you this before. You know, the, the whole you know he lived up to the bargain, and, and you win two Super Bowls. If you win two Super Bowls playing for the New York Giants, and you survive in that in that media market, because that media market will get Plunkett dogs in. No, not necessarily. Plunkett. Uh, look, I love Plunkett. Yeah, you, you, well, now you, now you just brought up a Stanford guy that I want to have in the Hall of Fame that I that I can't justify because oh, of the God, career, right? right? So you talk about the Stanford thing, right? Heisman now, two winner. Okay, let me. I got a couple of observations here. A couple of things I got to say with Eli. You deliver two Super Bowls with the Giants. MVPs. Yeah, and and you play that well in the playoffs. Those are some big, big notches on your belt. Again, and I've said this on the show before, he played a lot of Sundays like he was rolling out of bed from the mega kegger 
and you didn't know if you were going to get five five picks or if you were going to get five touchdowns. You just didn't know what was going to happen, right? But the most important quality to that was it didn't affect him. Like no. there are a lot of quarterbacks who went to New York who did not survive the experience. Oh, Richard absolutely. Todd, right? Crushed. You know, just guys, guys who went out there and, you know, Zach Wilson has been crushed by the New York media. Mark Sanchez, in a lot of ways, beaten down by the New York media because he couldn't handle it. You know, kind of a soft West Coast guy who could not understand the mentality of being a New York quarterback. Dave Brown, you remember that guy, got crushed. So to go out to New York and to play that way and to not let things affect you, and just come out and go, hey, look, you know, this is me. You know, you may not like it on Sun Sundays. You may, you may love it. I don't care. I'm going to be me. We're going to win titles. We'll do this. And sometimes, and I'm going to make you competitive every year. But it may not look so pretty sometimes, right? Like that's a that's a toughness. That's a mental toughness that I that I really respect. Is it good enough for the Hall of Fame? I still am. I'm still thinking, but I'm. It's probably going to be yes at the end of the day. It may not be right away. I don't know how it's going to play out. Uh, let me add this last thought. As for Aaron Rodgers, the the rivalry the rivalry between Stanford and Cal is different than it is between Miami, UF, and FSU. Miami, UF, and FSU literally hate each other, right? Mm -hmm. That absolute one thousand percent hate each other. Okay, it is right. It just you you look down upon each other. It's the funniest stuff in the world. I love it. You cheat, you know, on each other like I crazy. don't care about the Gator Farm place. I, I hate you I don't, don't you, you, because Gator yeah, you don't care. Him. Stanford and Cal are like two brothers fighting over a piece of pizza. Okay, we're the same institutions, right? It's like fighting it's, over blue books. Correct. I'm not, I'm not, I, look, I'm not dismissing that. And you guys come to us when, that. look, when you need consultants to handle your money, who do you come to? You come to us. If you need engineers to build the stuff that you think about, you come I to us. I go to my friend Johnny if Berkowitz. Know, if you need IT people who understand how to build computers, you come to us, baby. We build your stuff. and we I go to the nerd farm people. in Silicon okay? you, Valley. We, yes. are, we get rich. You guys go play your football. OK, have a good time. All right. Hey, but we fight over the last piece of pizza like we are brothers. Last we, piece of pizza. That's right. And you know what I'm talking about because oh, you God. have people that you fought because you had a lot of pizza. I can tell that it's, right it's, now. It's, it's, Come it's on, like Paisan. Come farm. on. You, you know what I'm talking about. It's like a nerd make. farm. It's, it's hey, hey, does your school ever had a billion dollars in uh, in in gifts every year no we do that because no. we know what a billion dollars looks like i just had a bunch of people putting money in my pocket i don't remember anything <laughs> I, I i don't i don't <laughs> i drove around in a corvette and lived on brickle avenue i don't know my, favorite, my, 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 my new favorite story was about usc trojans during their uh during their the reggie bush years and so the kids, the the players were all parking the in the parking lot next to the Coliseum before games, right? And they roll down their windows like two inches. Okay. Right. Do you know what I'm talking about? They roll it oh, down yeah. for two two inches. And then when they won the game and whoever got big plays, like there'd be envelopes in their car, right? Oh, yeah. The envelope gets slipped in. I was like, guess what, I never guess heard what Rick Riley did. So Rick what? Riley shows up once at our um <laughs> at the the hex center down in miami yeah and he walks in and we're all sitting there we got our i got a corvette jerome's got a bmw i mean he drives in he goes this thing looks like a brand new car lot i mean every guy had a caddy a beamer so oh, absolutely hey yeah. highsmith had a jaguar i mean the whole vinny vinny had a scooter which kind of saved it. <laughs> I, I go, that's oh, everybody look at Vinny. Face. Just go look, look at Vinny. Vinny's got a scooter. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, real quick, before I let you go here, is this a crazy comment? Tom Calton was a better coach than Bill Parcells. Percentage-wise, did the same amount of Super Bowls. He, he invented yeah. 
and created great football down in Jacksonville. The, what Doug's doing now is probably resembles that a bit. And the Giants haven't been the same. He did the same shit in New York that Bill did with the Giants, and he's got a higher win percentage. I'll say this. Coughlin is just as accomplished as Parcells. Coughlin deserves to be. Is Coughlin a Hall of Famer? I think so. I would okay, love to I see think him he is too. I, I think he's behind. In line, I would put him behind guys like Shanahan, Holmgren, and a Robert Kraft, who's not a, not a coach, but you know, an owner. yeah, I, he'd be behind. He'd be behind those guys, but he a you deserves. Think he's to be near discussed. Vermeil, like a Vermeil. Oh yeah, yeah. He he accomplished everything Vermeil is. I just would say this: there's no way in the world Tom Coughlin could have ever gotten it out of LT. Oh no. Okay, you're right. There's there would have no been way. a revolt. Oh, there's no way. Coughlin would never have made LT the player that LT became. No way. Dead not, on. Not, not a chance. Not Parcells. a chance. I don't think he could have even got that. When they drafted Lawrence Taylor, Carl Banks and Gary Reasons and Brad Van Pelt, yep. they had great linebackers, and they probably couldn't have sold that for bringing LT in because you had Parcells. Actually, it was Ray Perkins and Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick that sold that. Right. But there's just no, like Tom. But Coughlin, Bill was the DC. Yes. Bill, they had a great staff. I mean, you know, you have part of the two bills, which is just yeah. an amazing thing. But Tom Coughlin, if forced to be the head coach of a team with Lawrence Taylor as your star player, it would have been a meltdown one way or the other. Absolutely. There's, just no, I, there's, there, there's no way he could have. I got to ask you this question. Yeah. Do you think the owner of the Eagles, Jeffrey Lurie, is a Hall of Fame owner? I haven't thought about it. I don't know. I mean, I really, when I say that, I really don't know. Um, Are owners the last people you think about when it comes to um, you have Hall to be of really, Fame? You have to be really special. It's not just, you know, like, there has to be, your, your team has to accomplish a lot and – they're the winningest franchise in the NFC since 2000. Since I don't, he I don't, want to, I don't need qualifying. I don't need qualifying. I'm talking about: Do you win championships? Do you? Are you a brand? Are you? Are you changing? You know? Are Are you leading the league in some serious way? Like Jerry Jones and Robert Kraft are the the two owners who drive the NFL, right? And you, you got to be somebody like the Rooney's. What you're saying. Yeah, you gotta have be somebody who is, has gravitas in the room and can really run the show. You think the Glazers are? No, the Glazers are. There's no, no, no. They got just, two Super Bowls. Yeah, no. The answer is no. I mean, okay. I, look, the they're nice people. I like you know when I talk to them. I you know I think the people who rent property from them would probably disagree with me, but <laughs> um, and I think that the people the people in England might not take them very well. Um, no. you know, not when it comes to how they've handled the soccer team, but look, they've, they've done a nice job running their organization. Yeah. They've won Super Bowls, but what influence have they had on the NFL? What have they changed about how the league does business? Did, did they ever negotiate CBAs and keep peace to keep games going? Did they ever negotiate, you know, television deals to keep things going? Did they ever put themselves out in front on how should, how, you know, labor relations should go or shouldn't go and things like that. No, they've never done stuff like that. They ran their team and they ran and they ran it effectively. And I know Jeff Lurie's done a little bit more at the league level. I don't know if he's done enough at the league level. Jason, it's been awesome, my friend. I appreciate it, my friend. I can't wait to see what happens this weekend in week 18. Thank you so much. Anytime, dude. Be good. You got it. All right. That is our good friend. And we love Jason Cole so much. Please hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Who